How you doing, everybody? This is Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you're listening to the Mark and Me podcast. Can you believe it? It's the most amazing thing. They do all this talking and all these things. I can never stop listening to Mark and Me. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark, and coming up on today's episode, I'm going to be joined by Ralph Garman. Anyone out there that knows me and knows my love of Kevin Smith and everything Viewersky related will know of Ralph Garman. One of the best podcasters in the industry right now, his show with Kevin Smith, Hollywood Babylon, is one of my favourite podcasts out there. A lot of people say to me, do you get much kind of time to listen to other people's podcasts and the reality is when you've got Skip to the End and you've got Mark and Me and everything else that goes on in the world it's hard to find time but I always make sure I listen to Hollywood Babylon it's incredible and him and Kevin are just made to podcast together the chemistry they've got is like nothing else and it's with no kind of secret the the reason I podcast is because of Kevin Smith and stuff like Hollywood Babylon and Jay and Silent Bob Get Old and Smodcast, so it's an absolute honour to be joined by Ralph today. Now, I don't want to kind of avoid this news, but you probably heard this week that unfortunately Kevin Smith had a huge heart attack, and as such a big fan of his work, what I do want to say is that this episode today is dedicated to him. I'm so glad you're making a speedy recovery, Kev. Um, my love and respect for you doubles on a daily basis and to see that you've come out and you're already doing live videos and I've heard that you're going to be doing more podcasts straight away you're just an absolute legend and uh, the biggest inspiration that I've ever had not just in podcasting but in life and my love for movies so this one's for you. So let's get back to today's episode for Ralph. So Ralph himself is an amazing person. Uh, I spent a long time talking to him and I've got the best bits for you here today but this is someone that I've had a lot of respect for for a long time now. I was lucky enough to go to one of the shows when they came to the UK. I've heard they're coming back to the UK so I can't wait to go and see more. I loved his kind of feature on Tusk. I absolutely loved him in Red State and my god he was absolutely hilarious in the most recent Yoga Hoses film and It's just so much fun to have him on and I'm really, really excited to share that with you. So without further ado, here's my interview with Ralph Garman. Thanks for taking the time to speak to me today. My pleasure, sir. Thanks for having me. When you were growing up, what was it you actually wanted to be when you were a young age? Was it a radio host? Was it a actor or was it something completely different? No, I wanted to be a private detective. Oh, nice. Yeah, I thought it'd be so cool to be one of those guys with a gun and a trench coat and a hat and follow people and stop bad guys and then uh, as i got older i realized i didn't really want to be a private detective but i would. and um that's what led me to believe i really wanted to be an actor so that's a, how it started i really wanted to be an actor at what age did you start discovering that you had a voice that was absolutely perfect for radio um radio was the last thing on my mind i was an actor for my entire life up until my 30s and that's when the first opportunity came along for me to do uh, morning radio here in Los Angeles some friends of mine were working on a radio show uh, Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla were working on this radio show and they were leaving to go up to do a television program and they left a hole in this uh, cast for this morning show uh, breakfast show I guess you guys would call them and so uh, they suggested me and I met with these guys and I said okay I'll do this gig for a couple months until you guys find a permanent replacement and that was my first radio job job, and that lasted almost 20 years so it was just sheer luck that I fell into it it blows my mind really that you could work on a show for 18 years in one role you know the Kevin and Bean show is just it's absolutely crazy that you could kind of still have that passion every day and it came across that you loved it and every day was like a fresh new day for you. Yeah, well, it's the beauty of live radio is when the microphone goes live, uh, no matter what's on your mind, no matter whether you're feeling in the mood to be funny or not, 
that jolt of adrenaline because you know you're live on the mic just carries you through. It's the same thing as being in front of a live audience. It's just always gives you the energy and the passion to get through the through the day. Did you ever truthfully get nervous or did you just kind of nail it knowing that you were successful and you, you could do it with your eyes closed? Um, early on, early on I did because I'd never done radio before. I'd done television and film and a ton of live stage, but I'd never done radio. So the medium to me was brand new and it was sort of, um, it was uncharted territory for me, certainly. But I quickly learned that it was a lot for me, like I'd been doing improv and sketch comedy on stage, and I, I learned that it was a lot like that early on. And once I settled in, it, it pretty much came fairly naturally. I mean, the chemistry that you have with most of the hosts you've been with, but with Kevin especially, I mean, can you remember the first time you met Kevin? Yeah, uh, he came on the radio show to promote, I think it was Zach and Miri. He was yeah. promoting that film that was coming out. And we started chatting. At the time, we were both smokers, so we were having a cigarette out in the parking lot. And it was just one of those things where you know immediately that you click with somebody. And we were both geeks, and we were talking comic books and superheroes and movies and TV. And we hit it off right away. And then from that point on, every time he came on the show, I would include him in my entertainment news segment that I did every hour. And we would laugh and make each other crack up and... That's when we realized that we had great chemistry as well as a, a friendship and we should probably do something together, which eventually led to Hollywood Babylon. Hollywood Babylon is one of my favorite podcasts and you two sound like you've known each other since you were toddlers. It's scary that it was so <laughs> late in life that you really kind of met each other. Yeah, again, it's one of those things. There are people you meet in your life where immediately you have a connection. That's the way it was for us. And uh, then, of course, having worked together on Babylon for almost eight years it is it's being in the trenches with a guy next to you it really makes a very deep bonding friendship so he's absolutely one of my best friends and uh, the fun part is I get to work with him almost every week so we get we have a play date every week together it's it's uh, it's so much fun and the best thing is you said you get to work with him but let's be honest about it it's not work when you were there with one of your best friends laughing and a room full of people are encouraging you and it, it must be just never feel like a day's work no, it is absolutely the same conversations basically we'd be having at his house. Uh, we just have in front of people, and it turns into a show. So, I mean, so much fun. And then on top of it, he's been very kind to me and invites me to come play in his other sandboxes, so I get to do movies with him and other things. And it's just uh, it's one of the joys of my life. So when I was watching Comic Book Man a few weeks ago, I couldn't believe it that it took that long for him to come and visit your house. I mean... Your house looks like the place I want to live. Like, the Batman collection you have is not even... I don't know. How, it's like a museum. It's just one room. It's not the whole house. My wife won't let me have my collection spill out into our actual home. So that's why I have to keep it in this one room. And I have so much stuff. The only way I could truly enjoy it was to kind of set it up like a museum. So I've got glass display cases and I've got things mounted in lucite boxes on the wall and stuff. It does look like a museum, but largely because... I love this stuff so much, and I want to be able to enjoy it and appreciate it, and it is sort of my home office, so I, I've set it up so that everything is visible and, and you can access it, and it, it's great fun, too, when I have friends come over, especially these guys who have never seen it before the first time, and get to give them the tour. It's so much fun. Yeah, it absolutely blew my mind. It's like, I don't know how you get any work done. I'd just be standing there wanting to play with it all and look at it all, and you, even though it's yours and you own it, I'd just be like... I just want to spend a day looking through this stuff because it's just an absolute gold mine. Yeah, we're going to at some point soon uh, on my new podcast, The Ralph Report, one of the video bonuses to the uh, the, the folks in the higher tiers of subscription. We're going to do a, a long form video tour of all the different items I have because I have, do have some really cool items, original props and costumes from the show itself and a ton of merchandise from the 60s, vintage mint merchandise and i think it's never really been explored before so we're definitely going to make a video so everybody who can't come and visit to my home can at least uh, see most of it so why batman i mean everyone has their favorite but what is it about batman for you because it's an obsession for you isn't it you don't just have a few figures you have got some of the greatest stuff and memorabilia that money can buy yeah i mean who knows <laughs> who knows why you fall in love with anybody or anything i know it started at a very young age i'm old enough to have been alive when the show originally aired in 1966 
And I was two years old, and it's sort of a legendary story in my family that the first song I ever sang was na 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 Batman. They would put me in my high chair in front of the television, and I would watch and and be just fascinated, fixated on the show, and it never left me. That 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 uh, passion and that enjoyment of that show it changed over the years. I mean, when you're a kid, you think it's real superhero action, and then. When you're a teen, you start to get the fact that it's a comedy, and then as an adult, you start to appreciate the, the the performances and the work that went into it. But I've always enjoyed it on so many levels, and that show was an introduction for me to all kinds of comic books and superheroes and that whole world of geekdom. So it, it's you know you never forget your first love. No, definitely not. I mean, is it still as strong now? Do you still love the Ben Affleck kind of representation of Batman, or are you kind of done with it now? I I go and watch and enjoy all of the incarnations of Batman for sure, but none of them uh, comes close to my love and appreciation for the uh, the TV Batman. Just because for me it works on so many levels. It's it's hilarious and the performances and the art direction and the costumes. I mean, it was unlike anything that had ever been done on television here in the states. So. Um, I, I appreciate it on many different levels, but I go to see all the superhero movies and all the all the different incarnations, and I love Kevin Conroy's um, Batman and the animated series. I mean, there's a lot of great versions out there, but like I said, you never forget the, the one, whatever that Batman is that introduces you to the world. I think that always remains everyone's favorite. For you then to actually get the time to sit down and talk to Adam West must have been something you never thought would happen when you were a kid growing up. No, it's it was uh, a dream come true, really. And Adam and I, at the end of his life, last 10, 15 years of his life, we became very close friends. And for me to become friends with my boyhood hero, it's it's one of those magical moments that you just realize how lucky you are. Um, he he was as great in real life as as a as a guy, as an actor, as a family man, as a friend, as he was on television as as Batman, and I just I relished all of our times together, and I'm still very close with his wife and his kids, and uh, I miss him all the time. You were saying just a moment ago about kind of getting to play in Kevin Smith's other sort of sand pits. I mean, the fact that you got to go and work alongside people like Johnny Depp and Melissa Leo, they're Oscar winning actors. I mean, it's not just like you had a small part in a a little straight-to-DVD film. I mean, in Red State, it must have been mind-blowing turning up on set with John Goodman and people. It must have just been, like, surreal. Yeah, Red State was the first film I worked with Smith on, and in so many ways, it was a great experience, not only because... Well, sadly, I didn't get to work with Goodman because he shot all his stuff separately, and I was uh, I was dead by the time he showed up to the... I was hoping you were going to have a beer with him. You are going to tell me that you got on like a house on fire. I don't want to know that you never got to work with him. Never met the man until the premiere at Radio City Music Hall. It's the first time I ever met John Goodman. So oh. I didn't get a chance to work with him. But I was front and center every day watching the amazing Michael Parks work. And that for me was like getting paid to go to acting class. And uh, and my character was mute. So I never spoke. I, only, I could only act with my face and my eyes and... That was a new experience, too, for me. So there was a lot going on in that film for me that I really enjoyed. But largely just watching Kevin operate in his other medium, you know, in a whole other world, watching how uh, how he runs a set and how everything was working. It was really cool to watch. And what's cool about Red State, I watched it again with some friends recently, is that it doesn't feel like a Kevin Smith film. There's none of the stupid humor or the, the jokes. It's just a real serious frightening horror which you didn't think that guy that did more rats and clerks was going to ever produce it's 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 amazing no it changed the direction of his career in a lot of ways and i remember i mean i was there in the middle of it when he decided to do it and then what happened at sundance and what happened when it got released and the the reaction it got and i think if you had taken kevin smith's name off that film and had released it it would have got a very different reaction from critics and from audiences alike but it it is unlike anything he's ever done before for sure but i think it's also colored his work since and i think even yoga hosers as goofy and silly as that is has some elements of who he became when he started directing again after red state and tusk so it's great to see your friend who whose work you admire be able to stretch and try new things and do things that really make him happy, both you know artistically and in terms of working with the people he, he cares about. 
So, I mean, that's why I wanted to come on to. You were in Tusk as well, uh, a very unique film. It's great to kind of see that kind of creature feature, which we don't get much of anymore. Um, again, it's way out there, but Yoga Hoses is the most bizarre film I saw in the last sort of five years, and you've got a big part in that. Yeah, I show up in the third act and pretty much uh, get to chew up the scenery. That was a gift from Smith, really, and that's, that's a bittersweet memory for me because originally the role of the a reanimated Nazi scientist that I play in that film, the sort of insane uh, Nazi who's been in suspended animation all these years who tries to take over Canada with foot-high bratwurst men. I love it um, when you're saying it out loud. It just sounds bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Describing it's always a challenge. Yeah. Uh, originally, that role was meant for Michael Parks. He was going to play the Nazi, and his health was not good, and they realized late in the process that he wasn't going to be able to do it. And Kevin then told me that story and came to me and said, I'm thinking you. And I was like, "That we're nothing alike. How can that possibly work? And he said, I'm going to rewrite it so that this guy learned how to speak English from watching Netflix, basically. And he, he speaks in impressions throughout the film. And I said, well, that's insane, but it sounds like a lot of fun. And it was sort of a love letter to the hardcore audiences we've had for Babylon all these years who you know, listen and request all the impressions and stuff that I do. He was able to work that all into one character, and it was enormously fun to play. And like you said, I got to work with Johnny Depp, who was just charming and supportive, and it was it was a blast. It still doesn't seem real. Even when you're saying it out loud, I just whenever I try and tell someone about it, they just look at me like I'm insane. It, it, well, because it's a human cartoon, really, in so many ways. I, I kept telling Kevin, I, I said, you know, this is like a Scooby-Doo episode where the, the, the kids find out that there's a Nazi who's trying to take over the world with Bratwurst Man and he's built a giant goalie who's going to kill people. <laughs> it's crazy. It's a, it's a cartoon. And I said to him, how real is this Nazi character supposed to be? And then I started working with Johnny Depp, who's doing this insane French-Canadian detective character. And I said, okay, now I, I realize that you can't go too far. It's just anything goes and it's just, you know, go with the spirit of this insane plot. And that's exactly what we all did. It's amazing to see kind of Johnny Depp have fun because obviously a lot of his roles with Tim Burton are quite serious. Even the sort of Willy Wonka, you're still getting that serious kind of character. But in this, he just looked like he was just having an absolute blast every day. Johnny was having the best time and it was a, a pleasure to work opposite him because He's just a big kid, and he, he loves makeup and accents, and and he loves to dress up in wacky costumes, and it's just him having a great time. And, and you know, you, you you hope that sometimes big movie stars will be like that when they get on a set, that they still enjoy the process, but he really, he really enjoys it. That's good to hear, because I kind of, I didn't know how he is, and if it's, it sounds like he's just there to have a blast, which is, the fact he did it is amazing for Kevin, you know? Yeah. But he loved the character, and you know, it came, of course, from Tusk initially. Yeah. And when Kevin came back, he said, do you, want, "Do you want to do it again?" He said, "I would play this character all the time. He loves it. He loves putting on the makeup, and he loves moving that mole around on his face." Yeah, <laughs> he that's loves amazing. The crazy accent, and he just has a blast. Talking about having a blast on set and stuff, stuff like Shark to Person is it Lava Lanch? <laughs> that's a hard one. Lava, Lantula. yes. Which is yes. a common, you know, we're always getting these spiders walking around, uh, you know, volcanic and yeah, spewing, the, spewing flames. That's sure. just just crazy. I mean, that must be amazing to be involved in because I watch them all. Like, they are my guilty pleasure films. Yeah, those uh, those horrible, goofy, bad CGI monster movies have always been a pleasure of mine too. From when I was a kid, there was a show growing up in Philadelphia. They had a uh, an afternoon on the weekends. They had an afternoon horror show that was hosted by this wacky character and they would show all the bad monster movies and stuff. So I grew up loving that stuff. And when I had the opportunity to join in and play a, a role in some of those films, I, I jumped at it because, and I, you know, I got some pushback from agents and friends who said, you know, you, you should try to be a, you know, well-respected actor and try to pick better projects and stuff. And I said, there is nothing wrong with doing a project based on how much fun you're going to have in my opinion i think some of the best stuff can come out of that and i i relish both of those experiences because it was just 
goofy. And I got to work with Steve Gutenberg in La Valanchula, and he was a terrific guy. So, I, I mean, at this stage in my life, I mean, I don't have really a career to worry about. So I can I'm at the luxury of being able to choose stuff that I just want to do because I want to do it. So you were saying earlier about your impressions and, you know, watching Yoga Hoses as a big View Askew fan and a kid that's always grown up loving the universe that Kevin's given us. The in-jokes there for the fans was amazing, but these impressions you do are unbelievable. And when did you discover you had that talent? Is it growing up? Were you the kid always doing impressions in the schoolyard or was it later in life yeah, again? exactly. I started in elementary school, uh, primary school. I, I was able to... And, and again, I take no credit for it, and I'm not really that good. There are guys who do it professionally, like real professional impersonators who are spot on and sort of in in uh, inseparable from the actual thing. You couldn't tell the difference. I do a lot of voices marginally well, enough to get by, and then if I can make something funny out of it, people are, are willing to give me a lot, of, uh, a lot of forgiveness when it comes to my impressions. But I was able to entertain my classmates my school chums with voices and stuff from an early age i do the voices of different cartoon characters and things like that and it's it's like a, some weird party trick that i have i think you know people say how can you do that can you teach someone how to do that i think it's one of those things either you know how to do it it just comes naturally or or you don't so i take no real credit for it but yeah i started when i was a kid so then what was the kind of ones that you've really struggled with? I mean, the hardest one to kind of master, because only you are going to be happy when, you know, you can do it in a party or around a meal with friends and kind of be happy, but I'm sure you don't do them until you're completely satisfied with them. Yeah, usually it's the other way around. I I have a need to do one, and then I will try it and see if it comes easily or if I need to work on it. That came from my career on the radio, you know, um you know, I didn't ever do Donald Trump until The Apprentice became a hit on television, and then I had to sort of do him. Uh, I didn't really do a Schwarzenegger until he became the governor of California, and then I started to do him. So it, it, usually it's, it comes out of necessity for a bit or a comedy bit or a segment or something I was doing on the radio, and then I had to find out whether I could do one or not, or did it come easily? Do I have to keep working on it? Um but most of the ones that I do on the, uh, regularly came fairly easily, and, and it's it's easy and fun for me to do them, and that's why I keep recycling them. So what's one of your favorites at the moment? Trump. Trump's my favorite at the moment. Can I have some Trump? <laughs> I want to press the Trump button. <laughs> everybody I know keeps asking for more Trump, because everybody loves Trump. The most loved president ever, really, I think, ever. Unbelievably Popular president. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Is that one of your most requested then at the moment? At the moment, yeah. Just because everyone hates him so much and they want to they, they hear me do it so they can mock him or mock me doing it. But yeah, he is, uh, he is public enemy number one for a lot of people here in the States and around the world, quite frankly. So it comes up quite often. So what's the one that you, uh, what's one of your favorites apart from Trump that you actually took quite a while to master growing up? What's the one that you're kind of so proud of? Oh boy. I think, I think my Pacino, my Pacino is pretty good because a lot of people do Al from all his different films. You can have guys doing Scent of a Woman, ooh ah, or Scarface, say hello to my little friend. But if you if you really listen to Al when he's being interviewed, he is very, very low. And a little southern, too. Sometimes he'll throw a little southern in there for no reason, because he's from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so I like I like Pacino. He's, he's got a lot of colors to him. And what about Arnie? I mean, Arnie's the ultimate. That's the one that everyone at my school, when we were growing up, tried to do, but no one could do it without kind of sounding racist. You know, uh, the reason... Uh, you know, Schwarzenegger is so incredibly popular, I think. It's because he's like, you know, he's like a cartoon character come to life. You know, you can't judge me just by my voice, but people do, you know, because it doesn't sound like the most intelligent person, you know, all these things. But I think, you know, he's very, very smart and he's a good politician. And you know, But you can't help it when you're doing this voice. You just can't, you can't be happy. You just got to be happy when you do the voice. <laughs> Can I have you for 10 hours? Is that good? Can we do this as a 10-hour special podcast? 
So you just mentioned, like, you, you were working, obviously, on the radio for a long time, and I don't want to bloody rip a, a plaster off and go in the wound, but I believe they didn't treat you the best after 18 years. But, I don't know, sometimes bad things happen, and then other doors open. You got to launch your own Ralph Report podcast, which I've checked in on your Patreon. You're doing bloody good. Yeah, we're getting there. Uh, we're only a couple of weeks into it, three weeks, I think, into it, and we have over 6,000 subscribers already on board which is amazing and my fan base is and always has been remarkably supportive of all the different projects that i do so yeah this is my way of sort of uh building my own business i i am i'm taking what i've done on the radio and with kevin on babylon and taking it in a new direction and creating a new show which is still me but maybe some other sides of me that people haven't really seen before and um making a business out of it so it's it's terrifying, but it's exciting, and it's invigorating, and it is a brand new chapter that I was kind of forced into because they uh, kicked me out of my old job, yeah. Is is it true what we read online, that they just basically let you know on the day and we're our souls, or was it a bit more amicable than that? It, it's more or less everything you've read. Um, I, I was given more heads up. I, I didn't find out that on the last day i was given about uh, two weeks heads up that that i was my contract was not going to be renewed but it was true that the guys i work with all knew about it before i did and they were involved in the conversations leading up to that decision so there's it's 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 a strained relationship it's 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 uh, there's a lot of hurt feelings i think maybe on both sides and um yeah it's it did not end ideally but it did end, and and you know after the initial sort of shock and depression of losing your job, you know, ask anybody who's been through it, you only your only choice really is to, okay, what am I going to do next? You got to move forward, right? You got to do something, and that's how the Ralph report came about. You must have gone on social media and seen the response, and you know Kevin put a tweet out, and people were just basically saying fuck you to everyone on the radio station, and you know I'm not going to listen anymore. Ralph's my guy. The only reason I listen is because of him. It must have been quite touching to read all those people that were rooting for you and kind of, you know, they got your back. Yes, the support was remarkable. And there was an outpouring of uh, loyalty and love that I frankly did not expect to happen. And the thing was, and it's funny, I think this is the kind of the source of whatever... uh, strain there may be in the relationship with the people I used to work with on the radio is that there was so much of that and I think those guys got beat up so much the station and the guys on the show they got beat up so much on social media that they started to blame me for it in a lot of ways even though I had nothing to do with it these were just people expressing their feelings but they they somehow started to relate it to me and I think they got pissed off that I didn't somehow come to their rescue or defend them or something. But frankly, I wasn't in that mindset. I wasn't feeling very protective of those people. I was just appreciating the people who were rallying around me and supporting me. So um, uh, I've heard that the, they, they kind of blame me for the drubbing they took on social media. And I I don't know. It, I, I feel it's hard for me to see them as the victims when they still live in their uh, big homes and make their big paychecks. And I'm I'm, you know, trying to figure out how to how to pay my bills because the guy who loses the job i think is the victim in the whole in the in the in the long run so i don't know um like i said it's complicated and it's it's hard it it did not end well and it's a shame that it ended that way because it was a good run and we did a lot of good work together but um i i'm really excited about this next chapter whatever that's going to be but besides the route report i'm starting to write again i'm doing a bunch of writing on some projects that i had put by the wayside because when you've got a five day a week steady job that demands a lot of your time and energy you don't necessarily have time to go do a lot of different things but now i have that time and i'm going to go do uh, seth mcfarland's tv show the orville i'm going to be shooting a couple episodes of that coming up in the next couple of weeks so i i'm in charge now of my own schedule and my own uh, destiny in a way that i have never been in almost 20 years so it's incredibly invigorating yeah, the excitement must be great, and the fact that you've got full control now is is something that many people would be jealous of in a very weird way. Uh, they absolutely should be jealous of it. It's it's a remarkable gift to be able to choose your own content and produce it the way you want. I've never had that before, and no one does. It usually, even at the best of creative 
um, situations, you are beholden to someone, a producer, a director, a sponsor, a, uh, you know, a general manager, a station manager, whether on television or film or radio, it ends up being someone else's final approval that you have to get. Uh, with a podcast, you are your own boss, and that is a luxury that a lot of people don't get to have. So I understand if people are jealous. I love it. I'm my own manager and I can put out what I want and it, I've got no one telling me what to say and I can't say this and it, it feels good. Right. Yeah, but the the downside, of the flip side of that is, you know, you talk about what's important to you or you put out there what you want to put out and the upside is that's yours, but the downside is if someone doesn't like it or criticizes it or says that's crap, then, you know, you take that personally because yeah. you can't blame it on anybody else. It's you. It's your work. You know? It is. I'm there in the firing line and no one else is to help me and it hurts. You know, it digs deep if someone does say something. You're right. Of course, yeah. So after many years of being part of the on-air team, you know, was there a bit of a challenge to kind of go in solo? Because hosting your own show is a different dynamic. And I've heard the first few and I think it's great. And, you know, you, you have the opportunity to bring back sex you and all this sort of stuff. You have no one telling you what to do. But was it a little bit daunting at first? Yeah, it's a, it's a learning curve because I haven't worked on my own in a long time. I've always had other people to work with and... um even on my side projects, it's been Kevin or someone else that I've worked with. Hosting your own show solo is a unique skill set that you have to sort of relearn or learn at all if you've, if you've never done it. I, I've done it some, so I, I just kind of had to wake up that, that part of me. And it's also a learning curve for the audience because they're used to hearing you in a certain circumstance with people to bounce off of or talk to or uh, riff with. And when they're hearing you, host your own show and you're talking directly to them and it's just one voice, it can take them a while to accept that and say, okay, this is the new norm. He's, he still has that Hollywood Babylon thing and he does other things with other people, but this show is going to be about him talking to me directly and talking about things that matter to him. So they have to decide, is that something I, that I'm going to go along with? Am I going to go on this journey or am I going to say, no, I reject it. I only want to hear him when he's you know, drunk and belligerent with Kevin Smith. And I, I think both are completely valid reactions it's just you know people have to get used to it but that's the advantage you've got hollywood babylon to be with your best friend and have fun and literally get drunk and just host but at the same time people can now start to see another side of you with the ralph report because that is purely you and it's your personality and you've got no one else to really bounce off unless you start bringing some of your famous friends on but it's a good thing for the listener to kind of find out a bit more about you yeah it's a different side in the sense that you know with kevin I'm certainly the guy who, who's drunken and belligerent and I'm going off uh, on on people that I don't like and Kevin's more the cuddly, friendly one. We've got that comedy team dynamic where we go back and forth and that certainly is a part of me. But I'm also a family man. i got a wife and a kid that I love very dearly and I've got uh, sides of me of things that I, I really care about and, and I talk about in a very positive way. So it is part of me that a lot of people haven't been exposed to and I can understand for some people if it's jarring because it's certainly not what they're used to but like you said if you want the old stuff hollywood babylon is still very much a thing and we're still going strong this is only for people who are interested in exploring that that other side of me and other things and other kinds of comedy or other kinds of conversations the things that i want to talk about so it's it's really a matter of taste so with the patreon support being so huge to start let's be honest it's, it's overwhelming you must have never thought it was going to be so popular so soon it's it's very very humbling i'm sure um you've got some really good famous friends are you going to start to try and get them on the show and start kind of revealing more like that well we've been uh, very lucky so far what i do is i i always and I, it's funny this goes back to my radio days the guys that i used to work with on the radio they would do these interviews with celebrities, and it was always some short-form, seven-minute interview where it was like, hey, so uh, what can we look forward to in this next episode of your show? Or what? tell us about this new film you're doing. And it was just so superficial and sort of, in my opinion, always I, – I found it less than compelling radio, quite frankly. So I knew when I had my chance, so what my plan was always to do was to sit down and do a long-form, long conversation with whoever I was talking to. 
And so I'm do, I do that. I, take a, uh, I sit down with my friends, and I do an hour, sometimes two hours of conversation, and then I break that up into chapters, and throughout the week, they are my special guests for the week. So I'll play a highlight on Monday, Tuesday, throughout the week. And I think that's so much more compelling because I'm able to talk – to well, Jimmy Kimmel was my first guest, and I've talked to Eric Stone Street from Modern Family. I just did uh, an interview with Seth Green, Chris Harrison, the host of The Bachelor. I've got uh, Colin Hanks, my good friend, the actor Colin Hanks, is going to be on the show. Seth MacFarlane's going to be on the show. So I get to sit down with these people, and and they're people I know, but I've never had a two hour conversation with them about their lives before. So I learned things that I didn't even know. And I think it's much more compelling to have a conversation with someone in that format. And then I put it out over the course of the week. And at the end of the week, I give it to our uh, higher tiered subscribers as sort of a bonus. They get to hear the complete interview with all of the elements in it. And I just find it really satisfying just as a, as a person and as a broadcaster. I just think it's really the best way you can interview someone is to he- really talk to them about stuff that matters to them. And I think it's always interesting. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to me about this and, you know, m- my main hobby is speaking to people and, you know, I'm talking to you now. If you'd said, yeah, Mark, I can give you five minutes next Wednesday, I wouldn't have done it because I get that offered me all the time with these big, big celebrities and actors, but I don't just want two questions and a, a little response. I want to kind of delve a bit deeper and find out more. And it sounds weird, but just kind of get to know you. Um, it's the best way you can do something unless you've got half an hour with someone. You, it's, there's no point. It's the lost art, too. I mean, nobody does it really anymore. Even the, the, the late-night chat shows and stuff like that, everyone comes on to promote their project, and there's some witty banter, and then it's on to the next thing. And no one really bothers to sit down and do long-form interviews anymore. And so I get the, the best of both worlds. I get to do a long-form interview with my guests, but then I, I, I dole it out in small chunks so that it's digestible for people, and if they want to hear the whole thing, then they can as well. I'm glad there's still people out there that do want the whole thing because it makes me realise that what I'm doing now is worthwhile. But I just want to listen to people talk for ages. I don't just want two questions and, oh, by the way, my album's out next week. Check it out, you know? Right, right. And that's what I get. When I watch a talk show, I'm into the disaster artist in the room and I see James Franco and he answers two questions. Oh, yeah, I made the film for Tommy because I'm a big fan. Okay, check it out next week. And I'm like, oh, Mm -hmm. well, I could have fucking seen that on a red interview online. Yeah, and it's uh, tragic because when Kevin and I first came up with the idea for Hollywood Babylon, initially it was going to be a radio show. We wanted a couple hours on a weekend on the station that I was working on to do a wrap-up of the week's entertainment news, and we were going to do it as a radio show. That was the plan. And so we did a pilot, and we presented it to the management of the station. And after they listened to it, they said, no, we're not going to do this because no one wants to hear anybody talk on the radio anymore. It's all about short, little, quick things and then songs and music and short, little comedy bits. But no one wants to hear people have long conversations. And I think how short-sighted – this is almost 10 years ago – how short-sighted that was because, if anything, podcasting has proven the exact opposite, that people have a real hunger and interest in hearing conversation. And like you said, hearing people talk to each other about things that matter, it's always – I think involving and I think it's always interesting I want to talk about a bit of a uh, positive for you so without screaming and getting too excited how was the Super Bowl for you <laughs> oh my god <laughs> well it it's hard to explain to anyone because so few sports franchises have gone throughout their history without achieving a championship certainly here in the states it's rare So as a lifelong Philadelphia Eagles fan, to have that happen, it was almost surreal. It was almost hard to process it as real because after a certain point, you start to think, well, this is just simply never going to happen. And so the excitement of winning was amazing. And I just my only regret is it was not just not possible for me to get back home to Philadelphia to watch the parade and everything, but I watched every minute of it on television and what it meant to that city and to those of us who are from that city, it's kind of hard to put into words because it's a very personal relationship that city has with that sports franchise. And it was really just one of the great moments of my life. It was amazing. And I don't mean any disrespect, but I never thought you were going to do it in the final. It went into it. And I I just, I could have gone to bed thinking, Oh, well, it's the same winners again. Here we go again. Then you actually yeah. did it, and I, there's nothing better than the underdog winning. 
it really was a storybook ending. I mean, to lose our starting quarterback and then have the the backup have to step in and fill that role, and then to be underdogs in every game of the playoffs that we that we went through, and to win and to win, it really was something out of a film. It was amazing how it all how it all came to be. So looking forward then, obviously people can get involved, they can sign up to the Ralph Report on Patreon and get exclusive extra footage, all the interviews in their thing. What else are you doing? Are you thinking of still doing a lot more Hollywood Babylon? Are you going to come back to the UK? I know when you came to the Prince Charles it did very well. Um, oh, sorry, it's the London... Hammersmith. Hammersmith, uh, yes. The Apollo. Yes, Apollo. The yes. Apollo. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. We sold that place out. It's like 3,600 seats. That was the biggest show we've ever done. And we're talking about coming back because we did Dublin, we did London, we did Birmingham, I think. Yeah, I think we did Brum and I think one more. Was it Manchester? Manchester, maybe? Yeah, yeah, Manchester, yeah. Anyway, uh, we definitely want to come back. And what I'm thinking is trying to tie it in to another little uh, venture I want to make to the UK because my beloved Philadelphia Eagles are going to be playing at Wembley in the fall. Yeah. So it might all tied together nicely if I'm going to be out there for the game to build some Hollywood Babylon dates around that same trip. So I think it's very likely we'll be back in the UK come this fall. So when you're in London and you come to Wembley, which is a great stadium, you need to give me a shout, we'll have a beer. Fair enough. And we'll go and watch the game. That would be great. Well, I do appreciate you coming on. I really do appreciate your time. Um, It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. You are an inspiration and kind of seeing you go out there and you know, without a job and push back, I think it's going to be a positive and you'll look back as it is a kind of a, the push you wanted and it's only going to lead to bigger and better things. Well, I hope so, Mark. Um, no one gets in the entertainment business for security. You know, it's kind of uncommon that I had a gig that lasted as long as it did. So I really got better than I deserved. And this is the norm. I mean, for most performers, I know they're always looking for that next project and whatever's going to be down the road. So the, now that the shock has worn off and I'm, I'm able to uh, get my feet under me with this new project and I've got other things that, that are going to be happening, it's just it's a very exciting time. And uh, I appreciate you asking me to be on your show and to give me a chance to talk about it. So there we go. There's the interview with me and Ralph. And what a great guy he is. An absolute seasoned pro at podcasting, at interviewing, and just an absolute legend in the business. So it's... It still seems surreal that that happened, but an absolute joy to be part of. And the Ralph Report is going from strength to strength. I want everyone out there to kind of sign up and get involved because he's doing so, so well. And he did get treated that bad by the network that he was previously working for. But to go off and do the whole Ralph Report on his own, go solo and have such a great response already on Patreon is a... It's again an example of how to do things properly and I hope you all go and check it out because only as I'm speaking now I can see that he's releasing a brand new two-part special with Kevin, um, his first major interview since he's had that heart attack. He's got some great guests lined up. I'm not going to spill the beans but we talked about some of the potential guests and it's sounding so exciting. So literally head over to theralphreport.com, get signed up, throw a few pounds to Ralph each month because he's working hard and It's so, so inspiring to see someone go away from the big network and do it for yourself. And hey, that's what I'm trying to do right now. So absolutely awesome and get involved. Back to my previous episodes, I want to say a big thank you to everyone that tuned in. The response to Mike's interview was absolutely phenomenal. Like, um, I never expected it to be that successful. Um, He was absolutely blown away by the numbers and the amount of tweets and Facebook comments that people were making. And I was tagging him into all of them. And he was very, very kind of flattered and honoured to see how much you'd all enjoyed that. So it's great. And, you know, we've got some great more episodes lined up. Uh, The next episode's a real different one for me, a very serious interview but it's all kind of a learning experience and and hey a lot of things came from my recent visit to the BAFTA Awards Um, I'm looking at some potential guests from that and it's all growing from strength to strength so it's it's a good time to be part of the kind of Mark and Me world and I'm hoping to bring you a lot more Um, as always the best thing to do to check out more of my stuff is go on to markandme.com I've just revamped the website so you can get on there and see the Instagram the Facebook the Twitter the email it's all there Keep your comments coming, and I'll keep the episodes coming. Until next time, thank you everyone, and I'll speak to you all again in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, sweet Caroline. Good
the time never seemed so good. 